Welcome to the Meet the House episode of Rebel Scouts. My name is Jonathan. With me here is Nikki. Hello. And Nick. Hello, how are you doing, everyone? So, like I said, this is the podcast. Later in the fall, when the, sh- when the show gets going, we're actually going to be doing weekly. But right now, um, in the next, we'll have probably have a couple episodes, just kind of speculation. Um, any kind of trailers and stuff that comes out. Um, so, I figure, you know, to kind of start off, um, we've talked about this on our own, you know, you've both been on the radio pre indoor, but I figure, why don't we just kind of start fresh and tell each other about how we got it started with Star Wars. Alrighty, um, who wants to go first? Why don't you go first, Nick? Okay, uh, let's see. I do not remember how I got into Star Wars. That's a wonderful answer to your question. How'd you get into Star Wars? I don't know. Um, But the problem is that it happened when I was so young that I think my love of Star Wars predates my ability to form long-term memories, as I've said before, so I don't recall like the first time I saw a Star Wars movie or anything along those lines. Earliest memories I have uh, involve watching Empire Strikes Back on HBO. Um, I had some toys, and I just, just from as early as I can remember, I was a huge Star Wars fan, um, and so, of course, you had... Empire came out, and then Jedi came out, and and then yay, it was all fun, and then and then there, there were no more movies, and uh, and then they started coming out with Star Trek: The Next Generation. So for a while, I was all because I'd always liked Star Trek too, and so I was kind of into that. And then the then the books started coming out, and and my my interest kind of went back towards Star Wars a little bit. And then of course the announcement about the prequels, and then it's just been Star Wars madness ever since. So. That's the long and the short of it, is I do not remember. <laughs> All right. Why don't you go, Jonathan? All right. Um, well, for me, it's basically just been, I mean, like Nick, I don't really, it's hard for me to pinpoint a time when Star Wars wasn't in my life, but uh, I guess one of my earliest, earliest memories is, I'm looking at it right now, the gold box of special editions and those are really the ones i grew up with watch them on vhs nice. watch them over and over again but mm-hmm. um because i don't think i actually saw i'm not sure if i even saw the special editions in theaters according to my mother i did not um she would know yes yeah, she would know <laughs> um or at least she doesn't think i did <laughs> but anyway um so i guess that's what i kind of grew up on you know as I stated a little in Ready for Indoor that I was, I'm definitely of the prequel generation, um, but I'm not that kind of generation who, you know, that's, that was just my thing. And I later found the originals, you know, they've all kind of been in my life. Um, I guess as far as collecting, I, I guess Legos. I know, Nick, you're into Legos. Yes, and, uh, right on. And I started collecting since when, when they started with Phantom Menace. Mm hmm. Such a dream come true. I mm-hmm. was in I was in college when when the uh, Lego <laughs> license uh, with Star Wars uh, w- was was made and I was like okay well I haven't bought any Lego sets in a long time but I don't care I'm going to and so <laughs> I got uh, because they did a few sets before uh, before the episode one sets rolled out so they did things mm-hmm. like you know they had the first Lego version of the X wing and I don't remember what else, all they had but I got the X wing and then I got the big ultimate collector's x-wing so i was like no all i need is lego star trek which never really happened and so um <laughs> but but yes jonathan I, I definitely am with you on the star wars lego it, it was mm-hmm. a wonderful exciting thing that is continuing and that makes me happy yes. nikki what about you um i'm very i i'm like i'm very aware of my first star wars experience I was oh well aren't you special <laughs> i know it's because i have a freaky memory there you go um i was six years old my mom took me to see a pair of back yes then you can kind of figure out how old i am um she thought oh i want my daughter i want her to be kind of a part of this i want her to have a memory of waiting in line and having all this experience and I absolutely fell in love with it. I fell in love with everything about it. Uh, Empire is still my favorite, and my mother is now kicking herself uh, yeah. because it has been in, ever since that day. It has been a never-ending Star Wars life for me. Um, so I grew up. I read the kids' books uh, as the expanding universe rolled out. I read 
pretty much every single one of the novels, all the Jedi Academies. So anytime, if there was Star Wars, I had to have it. If it said Star Wars, I had to have it. I still have a lot of this stuff. Um, so my love has never waned. Uh, it has never died. Um, I did go see the special editions in the theater. Um, and, and the prequels in the theater. <laughs> and I too love these Star Wars Legos. Um, because right before, on. before that, Legos weren't, they, when I was a kid, Legos were just a big tub of, of bricks. So you could do whatever you wanted with. And then all, now all of a sudden they're like, you have to build certain things with them. Um, but, it's been a passion of mine since, like I said, I was six years old. And it hits me on not just, oh, these are great films level, but on an emotional level as a very shy, selective mute um, as a child. Um, it really made me feel like I belong somewhere. So um, to me, I've always kind of just lived in that, in that kind of world. Like, I might not belong on this planet. <clears throat> but I belong somewhere, and that somewhere is a galaxy far, far away. So I am a proud member of the 501st, um, future member of the Rebel Legion and the Mando Mercs. Um, I have Star Wars tattoos. I My car looks like a Star Wars mobile. So it's just it's just my biggest passion next to teaching. I mean, it's just there is nothing better. So we all kind of come from different backgrounds and different generations. Uh, I know Josh is even a uh, different generation than I than us. So yeah, he kind of sits in the middle between the uh, the older and the younger. Yeah. Right. So, um, but we all are here to discuss. And what's interesting with Star Wars Rebels, and then later with Episode Seven, is that it brings in a whole another generation. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking specifically to the Southgates. Um, daughter Molly. Um, I think, I mean, actually, there might be another generation older than her right. you know, or younger than her. So, um, you know, but so I think. I think there's the Clone Wars generation, too. Right. And right, the Clone Wars right. generation. That's my nephew. Right. So the Clone Wars, I mean, I was, you know, you know, almost, I mean, I'm like 18 going in to see the Clone Wars movie. And, and right. it's like all kids. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Yes, and I'm my age, and I walked into the Clone Wars movie, so... So, um... It was a little more than my own <laughs> Um So, I think we're... I think that's what's great about Star Wars, is that there's just so many different... We've come from all sorts of different backgrounds and generations. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think that'll be... Um, so, with Star Wars Rebels, you know, um, unlike, you know, the previous movies and stuff, this is... This feels a lot more open, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, we do know we are gonna get, like, um, like on um like you guys discussed on the clone cast Mm -hmm. that uh about getting obi-wan yes i'm very excited Mm -hmm. about this obi-wan business um you know um so i mean what kind of capacity he'll play in and we're gonna assume that james r taylor is going to be well it had better be it had better be him yeah um, did did you see? Um, um, maybe we mentioned it. My Swiss cheese old person memory is getting the best of me. Um, but the the French trailer. Yes. With the little snippet of him. Yes. Um. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yes, John. Sure. There is a trailer um, that was shown somewhere in France, uh, and uh, talking about how it's coming out in October, and you see a little itty bitty clip of Obi Wan in in a hologram. Um, and to me, it looks like it could be, and I've heard some people speculate on this, and it honestly seems most reasonable. It almost looks like it's actually supposed to be Obi-Wan from Episode 3. Like, it's the recording... Yeah, I just just saw it. (laughs) Yeah, that Obi-Wan made about, you know, warning everybody to stay away. I mean, although Episode 3 doesn't technically say that Obi-Wan's going to, uh, hold on, I'm going to go and then record a video message for everyone. You know, he, I mean, he kind of hits some buttons, you know, so I always figured it was more of like just a coded message. But maybe the idea Mm -hmm. is that he sent out, you know, uh, it was a coded, um, you know, a coded holotransmission where it's, he's, he's actually, you know, in hologram form telling everybody to stay away. So, uh, you know, there, there's a possibility that, that, that that's what that is. But then why would you make, why would you make an action figure for a character who's only going to show up basically in a voicemail? Right. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm thinking that if that is him and that is, 
uh, I mean, obviously it is him, but if that is supposed to just be him from episode three and they're looking at this old recording, that that's not the only time we're going to see him, that he's eventually going to show up, whether via hologram or in person, but, you know, live at that time. So at least I really hope so. I really hope so, too. I think he would be the perfect bridge between the generations right. and between the films and the Clone Wars to to Rebels. Um, and I think you really want that when you're starting something, even if it is Star Wars, which has a built-in fan base. You do want to, you do want to, you know, link it to something that we already know, right? Because um, you want to bring in new and keep the bring in the new and keep in the old. Um, so I, I really hope Obi Wan is at least a recurring presence in Rebels, because in my opinion, he's kind of, you know kind of is a rep, one of the rebels. Right, right. You know, he to me he was always a member of the Rebel Alliance even though he really wasn't. Um but he I think of all the Jedi, he was besides Yoda the most uh calm and the most knowledgeable and, and wisest even though he and he acknowledged his flaws. Right. So, um I we saw that also in the Clone Wars uh animated series as he was he was a human as well as a Jedi and um, he's such a voice of reason to characters who really struggled with that. Right. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, I mean, just kind of in general, you know, you kind of go on the internet, just like that French clip you saw, you, uh, you spoke of. Yeah, I just, mm -hmm. I was, you know, watched it. And it's interesting how all these countries, they kind of get these little clips and stuff and these articles and stuff like, you know, like before the Clone Wars um, season six came out, you could have watched some stuff from Germany. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, well, we're we're everywhere. I mean, there's a reason the Five O First is worldwide. I mean, there's Star Wars fans in pretty much every uh, area of the world, and I think the fact that uh, the company is, you know, acknowledging that and making sure that other countries get these things at the same time just shows just how popular and just how important star wars is to everybody um so right. how about we just um uh, <clears throat> unless there's any other kind of things you want to bring up i thought we'd get into some of the characters what you guys okay. think of these characters um so i think we get the clue that kanan i mean he's the first one on the list and he's like this um human male he's a padawan who survived order 66 and so we don't really know a whole lot about him, but we do know that uh, you know he's joined this ship, the ship of the ghost, and that you know I'm very interested about his past. You know, like did he did like one of his Jedi masters, you know, pass in Order sixty six, and now he's hiding out, trying to you know, you know, you know, kind of you know, uh, kind of right, help help with the rebellion, you know. Right. That kind of thing like that. And we also see that he's going to be, you know, helping Ezra out, who's a young con artist who isn't actually, you know, who wasn't, you know, born during that time. But he's, because that's another interesting thing, is that children growing up during these times, you know, they don't really know what it was like before right. the Empire. Right, they don't really have knowledge of the Jedi even, because it was after, you know, that's when the Jedi were extinguished. And they were probably just told a lot of stories. Right. You know, he's one of those, uh, that whole dynamic between those two, I think, is uh, without knowing anything else about the series, um, if, if I just had to guess completely cold, and, and I wouldn't really do this because speculation without facts is, is obviously always going to lead to some sort of mistakes, but... Um, that dynamic, at least on paper, seems like, with everything we know, to be the one that I'm the most interested in. This whole idea of the the, the Padawan that survived the Jedi Purge, that mm -hmm. has though that connection to the past, has been sort of hesitant to use it, but but of course, seeing what's going on with the Empire feels compelled. That that sort of that old Jedi training comes out in him, and then this kid that's. It's kind of Han Solo-ish in terms of perhaps questionable morality and, you know, hard life maybe that he's been through and, and what they can learn from each other and teach each other and play off of one another. I, I think that's really cool, and I think it can speak to the the generational gap that we have, gap maybe 
bringing in a connotation I don't mean, but the the, the fact that Star, as we've been talking about Star Wars spans generations, and and you have people that that grew up with the original trilogy or the group with the prequel trilogy or grew up with the Clone Wars, you know, and their perspectives are going to be different and how those perspectives interact with one another in the real world. It's almost like, like between Kanan and Ezra, we're going to get a sense of that sort of in the world of Star Wars, what it would be like for people who actually lived in those eras to, to deal with those things. So I think that that's going to be really kind of neat. Yeah, I agree. I think that's going to be one of the key um, kind of things to watch for and that they're going to, I hope they're going to explore. Um, so that, that to me would be the most interesting as well. Yeah. And I think it was Dave Filoni in one of his interviews, um, he was talking about Kanan and all these characters and that, you know, I mean, Kanan is kind of the guy who, you know, <clears throat> he's trying to kind of keep secret that he's a Jedi, you know, he'll mainly use his blaster. You know, it was yeah. just kind of the thing where, you know, you know, Obi Wan says, you know, oh, so uncivilized. But in this kind of time, you know, if you don't have to use the lightsaber, the blaster is the better choice. You know? Right, and it's, it's just... during it's during this time in the history of Star Wars that the Jedi are being hunted down. I mean, they didn't just all end with the massacre at the temple. I mean, they were hunting them down all over the galaxy. So for him to use his lightsaber is almost like a death sentence. Right. It's like, hey, look at me. Here I am. Come get me. I'm a Jedi. You missed me. That's right. You gotta kiss me. Perhaps you should kill me now because look at what I got. So we do kind of get this thing where like, um, you know, we also get the, uh, so then Ezra, you know, Dave Lone was saying how like this kid, he's like a con artist. He doesn't really know what's happening. He thinks it's like magic or something, but you know, he's like this kid who's just kind of an orphan and he tries to, you know, just get some stuff just to, you know, stay alive on the streets. Right. He's a you streetwise know? kind of street rat. So who could grow up to be a pirate smuggler like Han? Um, he's just trying to survive. That's kind of what I got from it. And that breeds some very interesting plot lines. Right. And I'm guessing Kanan's going to, we kind of get the gist that Kanan's going to be kind of the mentor to him and that Kanan is kind of a more secretive kind of guy who is going to want to, you know, he's, he's trying to stay below, you know, under the radar. Right. You know? He doesn't and, want it out there. So he probably doesn't need to tell anybody. Right. So, and I think this will be if he'd be kind of a, um, stepping out of his comfort zone or kind of almost like, Oh wow, this boy, he's force sensitive and he doesn't know what he's doing. I, you know, I better, you know, make sure he doesn't get too out of hand. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch him walk, Kanan walk that line, going, I could help him, but if I do, I might expose myself to the stormtroopers and right. the Empire. It's, right. that, it's that balance. It, it almost kind of, you remember the, um, oh, what was it, the, um, the slaver arc? Uh, from which season five, I guess it was, of the Clone Wars, mm -hmm. and and when when Obi Wan ends up in the, the the mining camp prison, and there's those times when Obi Wan wants to help, but he knows that if he does, it becomes clear to him that that the the taskmasters are going to actually take his actions and make it more unpleasant on everybody else. So it's that if I try to help, I could actually hurt. And so right. you've got the the Jedi in him that wants to do good and to help other people, but then the the reality of the situation that he's in sort of limits his ability to do that. And I can I could see Kanan kind of going through a similar type of, of ordeal where the the full tilt help that he wants to be able to give he he doesn't think he can. And so where where does he draw that line um, between balancing helping and not getting himself killed, which not getting himself killed is also a form of helping. So, so where do you draw that? Because you know, I mean, the people around him could get be affected right. by that as well. Right. Uh, so it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see how how uh, he and Ezra interact and how much he opens up. And I mean, at this point in history, the Jedi are half any living Jedi are going to have to be incredibly hidden. Right. I mean, Yoda had to go to Dagobah. Um, who knows where some of these other Jedi ended up. And Kanan being a youngling when this all happened, you know, he might be, maybe he's, maybe the whole Obi-Wan uh, thing will be him 
in communication with Kanan, like trying to protect him, trying right. to give him advice. And maybe that's how we get Obi-Wan. And therefore, James Arnold Pitt. Exactly, because, oh, it, it's got to be him. It just has to be him. Of course. Um, so, moving along, another part, so that if we stay with these, Force-sensitive, uh, we also have the uh, Inquisitor. And mm-hmm. rumor is it that Jason Isaacs, uh, who's a cool. British actor... Um, Lucius did... Malfoy from Lucius. Harry Potter. That's oh, right. yes. That's, right. That's another, yeah, uh, another Harry Potter connection. So, um, you know... I definitely, we've, you know, we've had, we've heard some sound clips, and he definitely has, like, this, definitely this kind of presence, and, uh, oh, yeah. definitely this kind of guy to be feared. All right. Um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> He's excited. Um, yeah, he barks at anything that walks by. Um, yeah, I think Jason Isaacs would be just, it's like the perfect choice. I mean, he does menacing so well. Mm. And his voice has got that, he can do that with that, that menacing talk, even though we're not seeing his face. He can definitely do that. So I'm very excited about his casting. And I'm looking forward to what he does. Because sometimes you do like the bad guys too. Right. And, you know, we also, we're also not quite sure, you know, like how much of, you know, how much of Vader are we going to see? I mean, even in this trailer, we didn't actually, you know, we saw someone else talking to the Inquisitor on a hologram. So it seems like right. there's a different kind of hierarchy of, oh, I go to this person when I find this much information. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, Vader can't be, like, contacted by every single person. He's He mm-hmm. is, like, the president and the emperor's emperor, so he only deals with the larger situations, the more grander scale, the grander scale things. And he leaves the rest to the, to all the admirals and all the, you know, the underlings that the he moths. has. It's a, yeah, yeah, if something comes up, I mean, the moths are the governors. They're the right. ones who are going to have to take care of it. Um, so I actually think it would be a smart thing not to include Darth Vader because you want to bring in these new characters and you want to get new characters. You don't want to base everything on the original, on the trilogies or, and we don't, you know, see him in, you know, he doesn't come out out in the Clone Wars yet. Of course, that was taken away from us. So, um, <laughs> so well, you know, plus I would like... not mind not seeing him. It'd be kind of cool seeing him maybe once in a while. But I don't want them to have to go back to that well. I want them to create new stories with new characters and expand the universe rather than trying to keep it like in this little puddle. Like, no, we we can only use these characters. Yeah, and plus you don't want to sort of present Vader as like it's like. If any time there's any hint of perhaps a Jedi, it's like, well, you just call this hotline. It's like Darth Vader picks <laughs> up, you know, the I think I saw a Jedi hotline. This is Darth Vader speaking. How can I help you? Did you have you seen a Jedi? You know, it's like, yeah, there's, there's, uh, practically speaking, of course, there would I'll be. I'll be this, right there. Yeah, it's a like, hold on just a minute. Okay, you, you said you saw him in the bushes outside of your house. <laughs> okay, get, slow down, ma'am. Give me your address. Okay, I will, I will be there soon. But um, <laughs> let me know. I should let you know uh, that I will be most disappointed in your apparent lack of progress if you don't keep him in your bushes. You know, so obviously you're going to have to have somebody that's, you know, the, the guy that's that's under him and that's under him and that's under him. And obviously that's what this Inquisitor is. I, I do think that you, you save Vader for uh, a dramatic moment. Maybe, maybe you show him early on just to, to establish that the Inquisitor reports to somebody else, and that puts pressure on the Inquisitor because it's like, well, if I don't find these Jedi like Vader wants me to, he'll choke me out. So so you've got yes. motivation that the Inquisitor has that is a sort of a vulnerable type of motivation, not just the whatever sort of evilness he has. It's like this also don't want to get choked out. So you show his... His um his his motivation for for doing what he's doing and that part of it is based on fear and that works out for the dark side and everything and then you hold on to Vader until you need to ratchet up the stakes and right. oh my goodness we found them and we're calling in Vader or something like that so maybe right. that's kind of how you do it you have a you have to set up the hierarchy right of how this how this new empire is going to work and I think you Vader is not middle management right Vader is going to the top and then the tippy top of the spire is the emperor who doesn't want to be bothered with such things anyway. I'm busy watching television. Don't bother me. <laughs> something, something, something <laughs> go over there. That's right. Um, so you leave that stuff to the moths and you leave it to the admirals and to the stormtroopers even. Um, and you bring Vader in on the big stuff. Uh, but you do need him to establish the hierarchy of how 
these things go down. Right. It's okay. We've got a group of Jedi. There's like 20 of them. Okay. Yeah. Maybe call in Vader. There's a group of 20 gathering somewhere. Uh, you might want to call in Vader for that. Um, but he's going to deal with, he's going to deal more with, you know, what goes to the emperor, what the emperor gets uh, not has knowledge of, even though he kind of has knowledge of everything. Um, and you, you don't bother the big guy with the little stuff. Right, right. And I know um, in the EU, um, you have like these, you know, it's kind of been established that, you know, it's the rule of two, but then they started adding, you know, like the dark side, ineps, and all sorts mm-hmm. of other different terms of who they're not really Sith, but they follow the dark side and they follow the directions of the Sith. So I'm wondering is like, what kind of, Sith powers, like, will he be able to use Force Lightning, you know? Or Sith Light. You know, I mean, it's just kind of a... I wonder how they'll kind of figure that out. Yeah, well, that would be really cool. Yeah, and that wasn't that one of those things that, that um, that's kind of why they, they sort of had the, the Asajj Ventress arc, where she kind of Dooku basically kicks her out. If I'm remembering properly, Dave Filoni was saying that, you know, this is something that George was kind of concerned about, is that that you, you, because the rule of two, even though it was discussed pretty more thoroughly in the EU, I mean, that was a George idea. That's what the, the last couple of lines of dialogue in episode one are about. So, you know, the, the idea is that you can't have more than two because they always kill each other off. So you can't really have three. And so this sort of where is Asajj Ventress fitting into all this, it's almost like it was a little too close to a third Sith for George's taste. And so thus it was a little too close to a third Sith for the Emperor or for Palpatine's taste. And so Palpatine was like, all right, Dooku, you know, you got to get rid of her. So I'm sure that 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 tension, that that thought process is going to play a part here and that the Inquisitor is also going to feel feel one of those sort of quasi-Sith, but you can't be Sith because that's not the way it works. And so, you know, Palpatine won't allow that, you know, sort of sort of thing. So, So where, you know, what all can he do? How does he think? What are his ideals? I mean, is it kind of like with Vader, where Vader, you know, by the time Empire Strikes Back rolls around, he's like, "Come on, boy, let's go kill the Emperor." You know, is right. that what is that what the Inquisitor's ultimate end game is? Is he like, "I'll I'll kill Vader and I'll take his place, and then I'll kill Palpatine and I'll take his place, and then I'll do whatever I want to," you know, or is he right. just a part of the team? I mean, is it that hey, this this Empire thing is awesome, and I'm rah rah for the Empire? What what's his his reason for doing what he's doing. I think that, and his abilities, both of those things are going to make him, uh, the, I think, there's, at least for me initially, that's where the interest is going to come in. And, of course, plus the, the awesome voice. So. Yeah, I think that the rule of two, like, what, do you, what happens when the, you know, the Padawan, you know, succeeds over the master? Right. It's like, does that, you know, once the Padawan emerges and becomes a master... It, it, in the Jedi tradition, does that master now get a, another Padawan? Right, right. It's like, how's that happening? I mean, how, what does George really mean by the rule of twos? I mean, there's only ever two Sith. Right. Or is there more Sith and just one master can only take one Padawan? Yeah. So it, it all depends on what George, how George defines the rule of two. Because, like, going back to the EU with, like, the Knights of the Old Republic and early days of the Sith, there were more Sith. Right. The Sith were a force. So I think it, the rule of two applies only to a master apprentice. But once you once you take the trials, like you know, put it in Jedi terms, then you go off on your own. Yeah. And well, well, see, and I always understood it, and and maybe this is probably just kind of what my brain cooked up. But was that the impression I'd always gotten was that back in the day when you did have the the Sith War and everything, and we don't know much about that, but I mean that is mentioned in Episode One as something that happened, or at least that the Sith had been extinct for millennia. You know, the, the impression I got that was there was a whole bunch of them, and then they 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 got their rear ends handed to them by the Jedi. You know, in about a millennia before Episode One, and then that's kind of when they went underground. And they said, okay, if there's a bunch of us, we end up fighting with ourselves and we end up calling too much attention to ourselves. So we're going to force upon ourselves that, uh, you know, just whoever they want to can claim to be Sith. But officially, in our minds, there's only going to be two of us at any given time, which means that maybe the idea of Sith is not so much, in one sense, it's not so much an ideology or connection with the Force. It's just a title that the the two people make sure and give to themselves and don't allow anybody else to have you see what i'm saying that it's yeah. it, it, it's 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 not it's it, we might say that it's not 
necessarily a religion or a worldview. It is a specific cult or a specific sect right. or a specific group. Um, and so that, that the Inquisitor may have the same ideals and beliefs and, and abilities that a Sith would have, but unless Palpatine and, and, and or, or Palpatine or Anakin let's say, okay, you can be a new Sith, then, then they're going to bound together and say no. And if you start trying to do it ab- above us, well, we'll just have to take you out. So I mean, right. it could be it's something like you're not lines. You're not a Darth. Right. You can't be a Darth. Yeah. But he could be like, an, not an apprentice, but like, uh, like an acolyte. Yeah. You know, like you an could... acolyte. You follow, the, you follow the ideology. Right. But you're not like the high priest. Yeah. And if you and start, you, to... you can't get to that level. Yeah. Because if you start to act like it, we'll have to take you out. Yeah, because right. I think another thing is that <clears throat> I think the argument from, you know, the Emperor, or not the Emperor yet, but, you know, pa- from Cedius to Dooku is that, you know, your um, Ventress, you know, your student has become too powerful. Right. You know, and I think this might be a similar instance where, you know, I mean, I think, you know, just like in the EU with Starkiller, I mean, it kind of, you know, and that, you know, it's obviously not canon, but, you know, with the EU with Starkiller, you know, he became so p- powerful, that, you know, that... He was able to, you know, take out Vader and, right. you know, and eventually, you know, Emperor wanted him to become his apprentice, you know. Right. And I think it's just that, I mean, it's logically that the Emperor, the Emperor would, you know, he doesn't want Vader out there doing all that. You know, he needs to be more right. efficient and this is someone else. So it would be logical that, you know, he would want something like the Inquisitor. Right. But he needs someone who, who is not also going to challenge him. Right. right, and he, and he can't just rely on like some bounty hunters or some special right. forces. He really needs someone out there. Right, and Vader can keep this Inquisitor probably under control. Um, whereas, I mean, this is because this is a position that could, you know, he could get a little too big for his britches and try to take on the Emperor. Mm. So Vader is like, well, what did they call him? Uh, Tarkin's attack dog. Right. Yeah. You know? Uh, so. I mean, it's so complicated because we don't really know what the hierarchy is yet. And, I mean, my understanding of the Sith going way back was it's not, it's, it was people who, it was those who chose to, to follow the dark side of the Force. So they were like, they were Jedi or like Jedi. Or could dark use the Jedi. Force, the dark Jedi. And they went off on their own because they were not following the Jedi Code. Um, and they formed this like the, like you said, a cult. So I don't really think it's like they could be comparable almost to the Jedi in their hierarchy. So they could pretty much do whatever they want right. um, in their training and how they see things because obviously the Sith don't really care about the rules except with the rule of two. Um, and you don't mess with the top dog. Right. You don't mess with Palpatine or Sidious or whatever we, we want to call him. So it's like, it is like a cult, and you have the acolytes, and you have the high priest, and you have, you know, the central figure. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to explore that mm-hmm. and see who the Sith really are, right. what what they really want. I mean, do they want to plunge everything into darkness? I mean, are they like the Daleks, <laughs> the dark elves of uh, Spar Time? Um, so you have so many possibilities, and that's what's so exciting about a new series is that that I mean, we there's so much we don't know right. that we that we might get explained, and that's very exciting, at least to me, is that we might have some things explained, and then there's new things mm-hmm. that will talk, that will make us question and lead to these kind of discussions. Right, and uh, I think another thing is that you know it's kind of and like you said about someone who kind of falls from the Jedi and finds like you know. You know, like finds some, like maybe like finds a hologram, hologram or something, or a mm-hmm. Sith holog- holocron, oh, holocron. Yeah. Yeah. Holoc- yeah, yeah. So maybe that's how you know later in Episode Seven something happens where you know a Jedi falls, you know, and finds that and starts up something, maybe not Sith but equivalent. So you know these Sith, you know, holocrons could be you know anywhere throughout the galaxy. Right, and we we have no idea where they've all gone. So, I mean, the, again, possibilities are just endless. And it would be really cool for Episode 7 to kind of get back into that. Because they're already going to have the Dark Jedi, or the Jedi Hunters, so... Right, and both, you know, interesting is that, you know, we're going to have new movies. You know, it's kind of amazing to look at it. We're going to have a new movie every year, supposedly, 
and mm-hmm. a series going on. Right. So Pretty we're going to have like a still probably a two or three year gap between like the saga, the episodes, and right. then we're going to have these other films that kind of give us more information about certain characters or certain battles, certain events in the history or that will become the history of Star Wars. Like, I'm very excited to see what Red Red Five is going to be. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm very, I'm, you know, I know we're not going to get Wedge because Dennis Lawson already said he wasn't going to do it. But makes me sad. It does. I'm I'm a proud member of the cult of Wedge. Oh yeah, and right that's, on. The cult that's of why Wedge. I love the. Yeah, there's there was an actual online cult of Wedge for quite a while, um, because we just love him so much. Um, I'm also excited to wonder if maybe we'll get in at least in the new series any you and McGregor, but I know we won't get him in in Rebels because we have James Arnold Taylor doing the voice of Obi Wan. So unless Ewan wants to do something else, right? You know, he it, said he'd be open to doing anything. Yeah, that's true. But you know, it's funny from a vocal standpoint. I mean, James Arnold Taylor, James has played Obi Wan more than anybody else. So yes. I feel like I feel like for the for, for Rebels. I feel like James should get the first shot. Even if you had wanted to do it, I would say give James the first shot because he's played that right. character more than anybody else. And then if James right. doesn't want to do it, give it to Ewan. You know, and then I think live action, it's vice versa. You know, Ewan gets first shot at it. And if Ewan right. doesn't want to do it for whatever crazy reason, you say, well, can we, can we put some stuff on James's face and make him look at it because we know he can sound it. <laughs> get out. Do, do you go that direction? And a little or taller. Might just, hear his, might just hear his voice. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, And maybe a little taller. That's right. So maybe I'll James R. Taylor is is tiny. He put some lifts in the shoes, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. It was <laughs> like, yeah, I think I think Ewan mostly when he like says he's open to it, mostly means a live action. But right, it would right. be cool if because he can do other accents. You know, he's you know he's a very talented actor. So he, even if you you brought him in as a little nod, mm-hmm. little wink wink nudge nudge, uh, Ewan McGregor's gonna be a voice in this episode, but you know it's not gonna be Obi Wan. I think that would be cool. I mean, he's such a fan of the originals, and it doesn't hurt that his uncle is Wedge. Right. Um, so um, I would, you know, I would hope to see him in some way involved, but I don't know how. But that's just because I'm a Ewan McGregor fan. He's great, and he's amazing. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he is great. I mean, he's, even he's the people. I mean, even the people who didn't really like the prequels, they still acknowledge that he was good in them. Or, yeah, I I've, you know. I've heard he was the best part of except for the Jedi mullet that he had in episode 2 that they yeah. then passed on to Hayden for episode 3. Yeah, the Jedi braids of some kind. <laughs> oh, braids that, with mullet. The Jedi braid was like Phantom Menace and then that hair in, in Attack of the Clones. Uh, they I love the mullet. The <laughs> Jedi mullet and then I there's a back on the old hyperspace website mm-hmm. there's is like behind the scenes videos and Ewan is in the hair and makeup tra- uh, room with uh, Hayden, and they're doing the hair and makeup test. And Ewan says, "Ah, you got the Jedi mullet this time." <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it's so funny. And I have a friend who played our Anakin in our role play game, and she absolutely refuses to admit that that was a mullet, even with proof. Oh, it's totally a mullet. <laughs> it was totally a mullet. <laughs> But it was a stylish right. one, so it works yeah. for me. I really loved how they they made Ewan look. I mean, Ewan, I mean, the similarities between him and Sir Alec were really when they did the overlay of the photos. Right. They were really amazing. I never thought of it that. And yeah, so when like when Ryan Church showed like the triangle with the eyes and the nose. That, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was it was spooky, and the eyes they had the same eyes, and they're both incredibly talented, you know, British actors. This is true. So who knew? They did good good casting. Yeah, that's that something was... George is good at. Oh yeah, he he does cast them well, and the voice acting on Rebels is going to be fantastic because they get really great voiceover talent. Mm-hmm. I mean, is Joe DiMaggio going or not? Joe, uh, DiMaggio going to be a part of this? Is um, D. Bradley Baker going to be a part of this? I mean, I'm you know. Yeah, I think he. I think that's. I mean, I'd be surprised if one because you know D. Bradley Baker he can do like any sound. Yeah, and I love when he's on like SpongeBob, and I hear the voice of Klaus the fish from American Dad come out of a SpongeBob character. <laughs> nice. 
So he's he's the man of a thousand voices. I mean, I've seen him at cons, and he really is. He's just amazing. And Maurice LaMarche, and mm-hmm. you've got some pretty great, you've got a lot of really great talent that they can draw on, and they tend to get the good guys. For right, stuff. and Vanessa Marshall, she's going to be playing Hera, the, doula, the, um, the pilots of the ghosts. And oh, the Twi'lek, yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. the Twi'lek girls. So I like that in this cast, we're definitely getting a lot of diversity, you know? We're getting yeah. You know, um, well, that's one thing they've never shied away from in Star Wars. There's, aside from the lack of African American people, besides Lando, um, Billy D, uh, who's it, coming I back hope, to Rebels, so it works oh, out. Oh, yes. I I hope we see something or hear about him in Episode Seven. But um, you know, I mean, with all the aliens and all the different worlds in the systems, everybody pretty much deals with each other as honestly as possible. There doesn't seem to be a lot of discrimination or hating because you're a certain race. Um, it's like, oh, you're from Malastare. Oh, I hate the Malastares. You know, oh, you're from Camino. Oh, I hate the Caminoans. So that's one thing I always liked about it, about Star Wars, was that it was very open and accepting of everybody. Yeah, and I like that too. And I also like that that Star Wars does it in a way that does in a way that does not draw attention to that. You know, it's right, just, they don't poke you in the eye with it. It's like, oh my goodness, look how accepting everybody. It's just it it's like let's not focus on on it, and in not focusing on it, we 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 focus on it. That makes sense. That it it's not this hang a flag on it, make a big deal. You know, almost like bringing up, hey, you know, we look different, so we could hate each other, but we don't, so it's good. You know, it's like we don't even have to bring up the fact that we could hate each other because we look different. Let's just let's look, look past it and not even make it an issue. And so Star Wars, I think, does that in a very optimistic sort of way. Right, it just is not an issue. Yeah. And I love that. And it's only when you, like, really talk about it and get into it that you go, oh, yeah. And that's one of the things I loved about it as a kid was even at six, I saw that, that, you know, I was the chubby little girl who was too younger than everyone who didn't talk right but i just kind of said okay you're just you're just from a different planet you know you're just from a different star system this, it, you know. it's a way to sort of see yourself and to feel not alone yeah yeah right. and i think that that's the thing george does so brilliantly is he social commentary without beating you over the head with it, right, it, just, right. it just makes it so it's just natural it just this is how things are. We don't question it. So speaking as, um, and then we also have Hera, you know, apparently she's the one that's kind of the kind of, okay, you guys, come on, we got to get together. Even though Kane is kind of the leader, as a lot of Jedi kind of put themselves as, she's kind of, seems like she's the one that holds the ship together. Right. Yeah. At least she's kind of like the, uh, I don't know, the mother in a way. She's like the den mother. Like, come on, guys, we got to do this. Let's go. And I like that. I mean, the Jedi are always my favorite characters, or typically my favorite characters, but I like the idea that it's someone else that's sort of bringing in a particular character virtue, for lack of a better term. Right. Uh, that that we're, we're going to see that Kanan is not, ah, the total well-rounded perfect Jedi, you know, that, that he brings what he brings, but that, that other people are... are you know, strong, I guess you might say, in certain other areas that that are part of what it means to be a Jedi, but that that again, it, it's 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 showing, I think, partially sort of what it's like for a Jedi who grew up without the Jedi Order, and right. then also to see that um, that they all need each other, um, that they all bring something unique to the table, and I think that's the thing. The cast is it's it is more like episodes four, five, and six in that sense, and that it's a a broad stre- spectrum of people from very different backgrounds coming together. Right. Um, and right. so Kanan has certain strengths and Hera has certain strengths and, and Ezra has certain strengths and Zeb has certain strengths. And they all kind of come together. And I think that's, that'll be kind of neat to see um, in, yeah. in a way that this almost seems probably more familial than even episodes four, five, and six were right. maybe at least I, that's kind of the thing I'm wondering if that's going to happen. Yeah. I'm kind of, I kind of get when I, when you were saying that, when I was, you know, watching the, the trailer is like it's kind of like firefly right and that yeah. everybody has a, everybody has a skill and they all complement each other they all have something the other one doesn't right and that's what i kind of get from that and they were kind of like family and i see that kind of happening that kind of um situation happening with rebels in a different way but using a similar uh kind of ideology um idea right 
Yeah, it's a it's a family. Yeah. You know? Well, it's just like Star Trek Next family Generation. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, maybe Very similar. So, maybe not with the misfits part, but you know, you <laughs> put seven or so different people with different strengths and weaknesses together on a ship, and you know, spend some time with them on a show, and they're going to be a family. You know, it just it happens. Yeah. And is Will Wheaton coming? Uh, that would be cool if he did. That'd be, that'd be fun, you know? Yeah, have a little crossover there with, uh, with Wesley. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm also curious about, um, you know, I think it was, I, I liked how, you know, I'm not, I wasn't really familiar with the EU version particularly much, the Mandalorians. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I did, basically, you know, I knew of them from, like, the Knights of the Holy Public game, you know? Right. Um, but... You know, I'm not really sure, but I hadn't really read the books and stuff when the Mandalorians came into the Clone Wars. And I like that they're bringing something that like that into Rebels. You know, mm -hmm. we have uh, Sabine is the Mandalore Mandalorian girl. And I think she definitely looks pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about her because we don't get to see female Mandos. Um, unless you're in the Mando Mercs. And um, I thought, and I thought Bo-Katan was really, it kind of reminds me of Bo-Katan. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, um. No, I'm excited to see what they do with Sabine. She's probably the character I'm most looking forward to. Yeah, and, uh, she looks like she's big into graffiti, you know, and her, and she likes to, it kind of sound, it kind of sounds sort of like the Mandalorian works. How they just, you know, like to <laughs> specialize and, you know, you know do all sorts of stuff to their armor, you know, make yeah. it look nice, so... Our armor has to be individualized, because Not, it's yeah. an expression of... We are. It's like the clones in Clone Wars, how their helmets would have different markings. It was because they were all identical, they had to differentiate themselves. Yeah, or, and really like, go ahead. yeah, and I'm really curious about the background, you know, because mm -hmm. we know how uh, Mando was left in the Clone Wars, so, I mean, how, you know, she, like, some kind of, like, um... I don't know. Did she run away, or is she just kind of getting away from that world? I wonder if we're going to learn more about that of the events that happened right. in Clone Wars. Right. And maybe if she's connected to, you know, the Boba Fett in any way too, because yeah. it's in that that period where we don't know what he was up to. I'm not saying it's his kid, but um, you know, that could, you know, she could have been influenced by by him in some way. Because I mean, it's. In the EU, life as a female Mando is not easy, so it's kind of rough. So I can imagine her wanting to get away from Con from whatever their homeworld is going to be called, if it's going to be called Mandalore, or in the books it's Concord Dawn. So. Yeah, right. I think she really is the, the the character that that sort of unlike um, uh, that the some of the other guys, uh, well, like Zeb, who we know nothing about his race, we don't know anything, you know. Like with with uh, Sabine, we know about her people a little bit, but just enough to know that there are things that we don't know, you know. Right. So so I think she kind of brings in that connection to the past, that connection to the Clone Wars. Um, but then also this, this sort of unknown question, like you say, Jonathan, of what has happened to the Mandalorian people since that, t that time period. So, you know, I mean, is some of her past going to catch up with her? I mean, that's kind of a common thing right. where these characters with these kind of mysterious backgrounds, their, their past catches up to them. Right. You know? Right. And maybe we'll learn more about, you know, maybe we'll see, like, we'll learn more about her idea, you know, her um, memories of Mandalore and what it's like to be a Mando. I mean, we might look more, we might learn more about the race, right? Which, and it, which you is know, exciting. And we'd be learning it through these new characters. It wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't actually have to see, you know, Bo Katan or other right. characters from Clone Wars come back. You know, it could just be these newer characters. You know, talking right. about their background. Yeah, that's what I would love to. Is like what's what's going on elsewhere in the universe? It's, when they started talking about doing kind of a Clone Wars live action. They talked about it like years and years ago. Right. Steve Sands, so he used to go to Comic-Con and he would talk about it. Never happened. But it was going to take characters that were not core characters, that were not even mentioned, that were totally new characters, so we can get other points of view and expand our universe. Oh, I'm sorry, Star Wars universe. I still call it my universe. Um, expand the Star Wars universe so it's not all encapsulated. And that was something I was really looking forward to with the live action series that never was to be. Um, so I'm kind of excited. That's one another thing I'm excited about with Rebels is maybe we're going to 
get to explore these new areas with new characters and expand our horizons a little bit. Agreed. And, um, you know, we have a couple more, you know, so like Zeb, who I think it's interesting that, like, Zeb is a, you know, a Lassat, but when you <laughs> click Lassat on the Wikipedia, nothing comes up. It's asking you for information. Right. You know, Lassat slash canon. So I think that's interesting how instead of, you know, picking, like, I mean, how many species have we seen in the cantina? You know, oh, instead my God. Of, instead of picking one of those, you know, we decide to you know, come up with a whole new species. I mean... I love it. I love it. I think it's fantastic. We don't... Yeah. They don't need to have a Malastarian. They don't need to have somebody like a Draconin who's like the devil guy from the cantina. Right. You know, it's... We're... There's more worlds out there. And we haven't even touched on it. And apparently it's based off of uh, his his uh, species, um, who's actually going to be voiced by Steve Bloom, who I'm familiar with from... You know, going back to like, you know, late 90s anime, you know, mm-hmm. and um, so he's great. He's um, does a lot of games and stuff now. Um, so and apparently so he's going to be voicing him. And apparently this this character is uh, was said to be a new spirit based off Rat McCory's concept art for the Wookiee Chewbacca. Right. And it's amazing how like how these concept art just goes from one thing to another. Yeah, I mean. The, I mean, they, I mean if you've awesome. seen the if you've seen Macquarie's wiki, it's almost frightening, but it's per, it's so cool. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Ralph Macquarie, and I just I'm if that I hadn't heard that, so that makes me even more excited because if they're using some of the concept art, which is just perfection, then I'm looking forward to it. Right. I have a big Macquarie statue in my bedroom with candles around it. For the anniversary of his passing, because I'm that kind of nerd. Hey, that's all right. That is all right. <laughs> and he based his C-3PO on Maria from Metropolis. Right, and classic. As a as a child, I knew that, and that <laughs> that made it. That's why I fell in love with his conceptual art. Nice. I have the whole all these lithographs and stuff. They're fantastic. <sighs> Miss him. Uh, yes, um, I know. Um, there's a certain podcast or you know or X, who who's part of Jedi News um, who he's very familiar with uh, Ralph McQuarrie and he constantly talks about all the influences and stuff um, I mean this guy was actually like a mint like a uh, like apprentice to this guy and I it's hard to imagine I can only imagine being like working under this guy learning directly from the master and then passing on you know it would what be the like experience working, was like it'd be like Anakin and Obi-Wan it really would, it, because he is, I mean, if you've ever seen, like, the breadth of his work, it's phenomenal. I mean, not just his Star Wars stuff, even though that's probably what he's most known for. Um, but he's just, he was a brilliant conceptual artist. I mean, he makes, I mean, if some of those things had actually been in the film, it would have been so different, but so cool. Um, you know, it's like, I just, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> about Ralph. <laughs> um, that's alright. Um, and I think, you know, and then, you know, we have this this interesting destroyed chopper, you know. It was kind like of this... cranky R2, yeah. Right. So, it's kind of like, you know, we had, you know, the, uh, the arc, the Sunny Day in the Void episodes, you know, with all the droids. And we had a bunch mm-hmm. of, you know, um, Cranky droids and some attitude droids. I mean, we had that other droid in the Clone Wars who was doing the opposite of what he was supposed to do, doing, and we all thought he was broken, but mm-hmm. it turns out he was taking orders from Revis. Mm. Right. You right. know, so it's just like these astromech droids, they're, just, they're faceless, but they just, just see the emotions. Yeah. Well, you know? R2 is, I mean, the best astromech droid in the world is R2. And you could totally tell his, his emotion and, and what he was thinking, what he's like, his, if he's exasperated, if he was upset. That's one of the things I love about the, those droids is that they do ex- kind of express their emotion. And so that would be very cool to have a R2 S. I mean, apparently he dislikes Zeb, which <laughs> definitely, and I think that's kind of a common thing that comes up with, you know, like, Specifically, the original trilogy, this conflict between man and machine, right. i.e., Han versus Three PO. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh my gosh. I love that, I love that stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like 
Shut him up or shut him down. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I love try the, to be helpful. I just know. love when Han just does that that hand move, hand gesture yeah, and Leia point, turns. Yeah, the point. The point. <laughs> Leia just turns him off. <laughs> you know. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah. I think they really loved each other after Ian the Spider. <laughs> I want to know what happens if through, when three PO finds out they used to belong to Anakin. <laughs> If they yes. ever reveal that to the 3PO. Oh, yeah, they need to. Because I, like, I know how I could be Daniel's reaction. I want to know what, how C3PO would react. Oh, yeah, because you know it'd I be was a... Built by Darth Vader? Oh, my. Like a total droid freak out. Oh, God. They'd have to, re- you know, wipe his memory again. But R2 knew, and he never told us. Yeah, that's, that's still a mystery. The whole R2 thing, you know. Why did he not <laughs> say anything? You know? Right. Still... So he... He did his job, and he just did what he was supposed to do, and beeped in exasperation at times. Right. <laughs> so, there's something going on inside that little astromech droid, and it's more than a little man named Kenny Baker. That's right. Right. Who is supposed to be back for episode seven? Yay! Yep, with Anthony. So, Very cool. The only actor to ever play c 3 Yeah. So, I think in general, you know, uh, in... Ready for Yandor, we mentioned that at the end of, you know, the, the Phoebus and Ferb special, you know, it's going to be shown on Disney, and then when it's, re- like, July 26th, and then it's when it's going to re-air on Disney XD August 4th, I think, they're going to end it with an extended look at Rebels. Right. So I think that we'll probably do, like, another podcast after that. Okay. Um, Makes sense, yeah. be a good idea. Just yeah. to, uh, I mean, hopefully... You know, hopefully it'll be a good, you know, two, three, four minutes kind of a thing. Something we could really talk about and have questions. Yeah, exactly. And have ideas about. Something that will just kickstart more, even more than this. Like, oh my god, it's starting. You know, I mean, because we're still not really quite sure of what this date, of when it's starting. Because, I mean, you know, October is a very good possibility, like, like we've read some places. Um, Yeah, all, every, well, we both places said, I think, Maybe one or two places I saw said October, and everything else is just fall. Right. Yeah, way to get specific. Um, a whole season. Wow. Okay. I mean, there but, was. Uh, I mean, way back, you know, they, they were originally saying that it was going to be like a one-hour special in the summer. Right. Season. But I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's happening now. Yeah, it's uh, already I mean, July, so yeah. I don't know, so I think yeah. that kind of. Well, we've we've got another two months for it. So maybe, but I doubt it because we would have heard something by now. Right, you would think so, yeah. The way Disney is so into promotion, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, they want it. I'm surprised they don't have an actual firm date. Right. Because it's their channel. I mean, they own the Disney channels. It's their property. They own Star Wars. You'd think that it would be, you know, no-brainer, put it in here. Right, right. Um, so it just makes me wonder what else they've got coming up and what they're thinking is, you know, why are they not telling us? Yeah. What are you not telling me? What is the I, mouse yeah. not telling us? I know there are things about the Force that they're not telling me. <laughs> oh, whiny Anakin. I love him. I love him. I do, too. I do, too. I was like, now we know where Luke gets it. That's right. Yeah. It's gross. <laughs> it's power converters. It's coarse, rough, <laughs> irritating. And my boy's yeah. going to talk just like me. Even Padme was a little whiny. That's true. I mean, didn't get any of that. That's right. It's like an you're awkward break, Anakin, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> it's like, Luke, guess what, buddy? You're going to get all that. All that. Mommy, daddy, yeah. whining coming to you. Yeah, Leia didn't get any of that in her little separate. It's much like in the movie Twins, where all of the, the virtue and the strength went into Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, and all the junk that was left over went into Danny DeVito's. <laughs> well, I'm, with that. I'm, yeah, <laughs> how, how about them apples? Well, with that, I think we go to end this. Okay. Thing, you know, um, so um, I guess we'll just kind of end with uh, s- social media. Do you want to go, um, uh, Nikki? Sure. So, um, I can be found on Twitter at iHeartColson or at DiscoGriff, G-R-Y-F-F as in Gryffindor, or on Tumblr at punk, uh, com. Nick? Uh, let's see. Um, the only the only twittering that we uh, that I have is uh, the <laughs> inner dorkdom, uh, which is just at inner dorkdom, um, and uh, so I guess that would be uh, the best uh, way, sort of outside whatever 
you know, uh, Rebel Cast, Rebel Scout specific stuff we come up with. So I guess that would be kind of, at least for right now, uh, that would be probably the best way to, to, to reach out and to, and to say hello and to listen to whatever I say. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> also make sure to listen to their, uh, Clone War Clone Cast. The yeah, we, farewell. Right, we every once in a while bust up in the uh, the the Southgate Media Star Wars feed for some for some Clone Cast action. Um, we are going to be sort of again off and on, slowly going through the rest of the Clone Wars. We've got the last arc from season six to cover. Uh, which we're going to do probably relatively soon. We, want, we definitely want to get that finished by the time that Rebels begins. Um, but then, time permitting, schedule permitting, maybe breaks and Rebels permitting. Uh, we we do still. We never talked about season five on the show, so we're gonna, most of it. So we're going to kind of go back and do that some. So every once in a while, we'll we'll, we'll kind of um, you'll hear the the crazy uh, Josh and Nick 100 go stuff, and so you'll get that every once in a while. Yeah. And we'll try to get that on on the Rebels show. Yeah, I'm but, sure we'll I'm sure we'll get some zaniness, especially once Josh shows up, and you know we <laughs> just again we can't help ourselves. So so it, you'll you'll get some craziness uh, in here as well. We hope it'll be a uh, what, what sort of educational and entertaining and fun all at the same time, kind of rolled into one. Exactly. Absolutely. Hope that both uh, are happening at the same time. You know, Jenny. Yep. <laughs> and if you listen to the Inner Dorton, you can. Hear tons and tons of Forrest Gump impressions. Yes, <laughs> by people who actually live in Alabama, and so take that. Because in the movie, when 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 they're going to sit in the bus, and the one girl's like, "Can't sit here, seats taken." We don't say here in Alabama. <laughs> We're not Southern bells. We're not. But I declare, but look, we don't talk that way in Alabama. I don't think we've ever talked that way. So uh, you want authentic uh, uh, Forrest Gump action? Uh, then then that's the place to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. a great show, and I've and I followed it for we appreciate several that. years now. And uh, I know people from Alabama, and I agree they don't talk. That. I have friends who live there; they don't talk like that. See, there you go. Truth is not in Hollywood, people. It's exactly, just... unless and it's Star Wars. Then yeah. You can follow me at Jebel Forty Nine er, as well as the Geek Everything page and blog, and you know, trying to do some stuff over there, um, as well as also I also try to tweet Radio Free Indoor Twitter. So go over there, follow that. Um, so I think that's it. So uh, thanks for joining me, guys. No problem. Absolutely. And I'll see you in a month or so. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. If you would like to donate to help pay for this and other Southgate Media Group podcasts, simply go to our website, southgatemediagroup.com, and click on the donate button. It can be as little as a dollar or, well, as much as you want. (laughs) Help keep this fun going by supporting this and our other shows. Thanks again for listening, everyone. You're the best fans in the world.